about how uh, last year we increased our digital um, giving, new donations, by 91%. Um, uh, but it's going to be a story that involves us learning a lot from mistakes and, and how not to do things as well as how to do things. Um, so I, hopefully there'll be inspiration for you. This isn't going to be all about we did some amazing big project and it worked out brilliantly well. Um, anyway, so um, I, I thought I, my job is I'm, I'm a head of fundraising of a charity. Sorry, I'm moving, aren't I? Um, I'm head of fundraising for charity and here I am with you in your, in your community. Why am I here? Well, it's because for me, uh, and for about a decade now, uh, digital is, is central to everything that we do in fundraising. And just to illustrate that point, here's an anecdote. Back in 2012, I went to this conference in Docklands about a, a database uh, called Salesforce that many of you may have heard about. And I saw a presentation at this conference. There were 14,000 people there about a customer service center of Sony in the US. And they were integrating uh, telephone with uh, social media and basically everything in this one cu customer center uh, using a database. And I thought, my god, that's it. And I literally rushed out of the conference, called our database manager and alarmed her a lot by saying, this is what we were going to do. And then I called this guy, Hamish, who um, at a company called Valdata that worked with a lot of big UK charities, and told him I'd seen the future of his business. It was called Salesforce. And, Hamish was very polite um, and didn't think that I completely lost my mind. I was so excited because I thought the solution to all the problems that we faced in fundraising would be this wonderful integrated system that we were going to get. But it didn't work out that way. And I'll come back to that. Uh, why? Now, to take you on a little bit of a journey through everything that we've done, it's necessary in a short amount of time for me to explain the organization I work for. Med South Sans Frontier, MSF for short, uh, is a charity indeed, but we're a particular type of charity. On ordinarily, I could do an entire talk about that. I'm not. Um, so we're a humanitarian charity. Now, the word is used and abused a lot. Um, we've heard about, for example, humanitarian bombing, um, things like that. For us, it's not about bombing people. Um, There's three core concepts behind the idea of humanitarian aid. And, the, and really, we focus on our work in areas of war and conflict. The first one is, should be an absolute no-brainer, which is impartiality, treating people according to their needs and with no other consideration. In, in a battlefield uh, a situation, you, you, do, you describe that as triage. The people that you don't need to help immediately, the people who are beyond help, and the third group you focus on. And this goes back to the founding of the International Committee of the Red Cross in the middle of the 19th century, impartiality. The second idea is actually not a moral one, it's a practical one, which is if you're going to go into the middle of a battlefield and one side is fighting the other and treat somebody who's wounded, it's necessary for both sides to not see you as being part of the battle, to be separate from it. You can't afford to be seen taking sides, because if I'm on this side, you're going to shoot me, and if I'm on this side, you're going to shoot me. So practically, to do this work, you need to be seen as being neutral. It's not enough at all to just know that you're neutral, you're not taking sides. You have to be seen to be neutral. And the third part of being humanitarian, it really comes out of the first two, is you need to be independent of any interest involved in a conflict. So to symbolize that, this is Paul McMaster. He's a retired um, uh, professor of... Um, transplant surgery from the West Midlands. He's the chair of our board in the UK. The board of our charity and every MSF around the world is made up of people who work in the front line as volunteers. And on Christmas, just 22nd of December, he was in a meeting in our office. He was due to spend Christmas with his family. Instead, he went to South Sudan to work on a huge, massive emergency there, a conflict, hundreds of thousands of people fleeing fighting, to be part of a team, treating people according to need, this photograph is actually taken of a, a, a Sudanese refugee, South Sudanese refugee in Ethiopia, but treating people according to need. Now, to mobilize that aid in South Sudan at, at no notice requires resources of a certain type. And these are just some of the figures of what, the kind of people who were provided with medical services in the first couple of months. In fact, those numbers are far higher now. This stuff really matters, it saves lives, and you need the resources to do the job. 
Second point, going, that relates to impartiality, neutrality. If, you, if you're working in an area of conflict, you can't be seen to be taking money from the people with the guns if you're doing the aid work, because you become a target. And the third point, this is from this week, we um, had some strong things to say about the, the welfare of, of refugees in South Sudan, because the UN are not looking after them remotely adequately, and we were able to speak out about that because we weren't relying on them for funding, we were independent. So when it comes to fundraising, our charity, in terms of funding, needs money which is independent of any interest involved in the conflict, which is available when and where needed without any other consideration, and we need it to be available whenever we need it, secure. What does that look like? Well, in every country around the world where we raise money, bar one, the United States, it looks like this. Of course, we call it direct debit in the UK. It has other names around the world. But everything we do in our fundraising, and our charity I work for is about monthly giving. And that's really important for what happens next in this story. So in the UK, I'm just going to talk a bit about the UK experience now. We went out to get that support, those monthly donations, needed to pay for that work, not for people like me in offices like ours, but to go to where they were needed. And we decided, I decided actually, having read one book on, <laughs> on demographics, that this would be our target audience for, to get those monthly donations for humanitarian aid in the UK. And here are all the kind of characteristics of them. High net worth, they have money, they've traveled, they read the news, hard to win. And this one, absolutely critical in what happened to us over about the last 10, 15 years. Early adapters of whatever's new, including technology. So initially, things went very well for about the first 10 years. We produced this, these style of printed campaigns with coupons on that people could fill in and send in. And then we'd send them lovely magazines telling them about our work. We have a very different approach. We don't really ask people for money. We just draw them close. We put graphic posters in our newsletter, by the way. That's why I'm so interested to see Lindsay's presentation, which we pour months of work in. We send all this stuff out with love and care, and we hope that we get the support that's, that will come back. But unfortunately, around about 2005 onwards, that whole model started to break down and collapse. So we had growth, getting these direct debits in, and then it started to fall apart. Oh, and sorry, yes, just, this is a slide from some research we did at the end of 2012. You know, we, we think we're pretty good. People love the way we treat them. We, don't, we treat them differently to other charities. It all looks great, but in fact, there's a really big problem. So here's a quote from the, the point where it really started to fall apart from us, 2005, from an unlikely source, perhaps, for inspiration for this gathering. This is a quote from Rupert Murdoch in his speech to the American Society of Newspaper Editors in 2005, where he kind of said, I suspect many of you in this room did, um, basically were quietly hoping that this thing called the di digital revolution would just limp along. Well, it hasn't, it won't, and it's a fast developing reality. So today, if you try and go into the Times website, you hit their paywall. And this is just one illustration of something which I find incredibly frustrating when I talk to people who do the same job as me in charities, fundraisers, is if you look at the airline industry, if you look at the newspaper industry, if you look at so many aspects of our lives, they've been utterly revolutionized by digital. And yet there we were, still putting our leaflets in newspapers with coupons on and measuring the response from that. Big problem. The world was moving on, and we weren't moving with it. So the, the tools that we were using were no longer working as well for that reason. And here's another challenge I, th I realized we were facing. I found this in a blog. I love this. It's a bit old, but it's still great. Does anyone remember pages, right? And then we had mobile phones, and then email, and the web. I never worked out what that was. Blogs, RSS. Does anyone remember MySpace? Uh, and Twitter. And here we are. In fact, you know, usually there's, there's always somebody who's looking at their email or, t or tweeting. He's talking about Twitter. But, you know, I, we just... In trying to get that message out to people, putting leaflets in newspapers, is it going to be enough? Can we get people's attention at all? I mean, our income, basically, our new donations were started to flatline. We couldn't grow. The tools we were using weren't working. We were struggling to get people's attention. And here really is the kind of, the, I'm a fundraiser. Here is the killer thing for me, the thing that really was terrifying. 
I got this from a, a paper by an American database company called Convio. This was published in, I think, 2011, The Next Generation of Giving. Causation may be impossible to track. Um, it was so much easier before the internet came along and wrecked everything. We can no longer measure what works and doesn't work. There's a pioneer of American retail, I, I wish I could remember his name, around the turn of the 19th, 20th century, who said, I know half our advertising works, I just don't know which half. In a digital world, people, what they're doing, they're seeing the leaflet and they're going onto your site and you don't know what's causing them to do that. So what you then do is you pull the investment out of the things that you think are no longer working and suddenly that starts to collapse. We are actually starting to implode. And a while ago, about two years ago, we started working with a web conversion company who worked with people like Avis and Hilton Hotels. And they said, we have clients who do just that thing. They only want to invest in retargeting because it looks great and, the things that, and they not spend money on the things that don't work and they go like that. So how are we going to get around that? Well, we had a brilliant idea, which, by the way, turned out to be a disaster. So we thought, we'll do an integrated campaign. We'll do what our Spanish MSF has been doing for years. We'll put stuff out um, in print media, posters, radio, all manner of different new digital channels. It's going to be cool. We'll push all this stuff out. The money will come in through our site. And that will be our new model. We'll get around all of this problem of continuous partial attention, the problem of tools not working, and the measurement problem will be solved. And we did all of that, and we pushed this campaign out in 2011 called MSF Delivers. And here is a lovely diagram of how it was meant to work. I actually did a presentation on this a couple of years ago where I talked about the fact it didn't work. And afterwards, someone came up to me and said, you know, can you, you know, which was the supplier that you work with? Because we're going to do it. And I was going, no, no. It looks cool, but it didn't work, you know. Um, we drove a lot of traffic to this site. Unfortunately, they didn't really give anything. And, you know, some aspects worked. The effort to deliver this almost killed our kind of digital and fundraising teams. We leapt forward a generation in terms of our capabilities. But the sheer complexity of this allied to the fact that the systems that we had really weren't built to handle this, and okay, you know, we were using Google Analytics and things like that, just meant that we, the complexity overwhelmed us. So actually, we were back where we started, and um, we did a review with some external consultants who came in and reviewed the process that we went through with this campaign. And it was a pretty tough process to go through because they were um, unflinching. Um, and I could summarize the findings uh, as being, well, this for me is a kind of a concept I learned from a medical colleague in, in our organization, which I found very useful in, in thinking about this. Rate determining step. It's from chemistry, and it's the idea that the slowest part in any kind of reaction determines the speed of that reaction. And in going, trying to go through this change of dealing with digital, the rate determining step was our cultural inability to manage massive projects. We just couldn't do it. We just couldn't handle this. So what were we going to do? So we thought, so we could have basically decided to then go down the route of doing exactly what I said I wanted to do at the beginning of 2012. Change all our systems, make them much simpler, integrate them, and then we could do this new integrated marketing. And at that time, I was talking to a, a, an IT consultant who works with charities called Ian Pritchard. And he said, if you do that, if you go and get this wonderful system that's going to simplify everything for you, bearing in mind what you know about your ability to manage big projects at the moment and many other considerations, I'd just like you to imagine your nice fundraising team and how well they're running. We all work in one room, our entire charity. Taking a hand grenade, pulling the pin out, and throwing it into the middle of them. That's what moving to this new database will do to you. So I went, oh, OK. So we also got another consultant in who um, did a much more complex report that came up with the same <coughs> findings. And basically, what we decided to do instead was to, if you've got a spade, it's not very pretty, but work with it and break everything down to bite-sized chunks. So starting with the measurement problem, this inability to measure what was coming in via digital in relation to what was going on in the rest of the world. Our media buying agency started to look at, when we were putting campaigns out there that were offline, looking at the online response, 
and bit by bit, agonizingly slowly, but very carefully isolating the response that we could identify and attributing that. And what we suddenly realized was that things that we thought were failing were genuinely working. And in case you think that's wishful thinking, since then, we've reinvested in some of those tools and we're seeing the results. I'll come to that later. This is a breakthrough moment. Interestingly, it was the media agency, a guy called Richard Slater at our media buying agency, who just did this in his spare time for his interest. And it changed uh, radically our view of what we were doing in fundraising. I mean, it's such a basic idea. You pick something out of your newspaper, why wouldn't you go and make a donation on an iPad, right? Not on a coupon, maybe. The next thing we did is we did a massive audit of all our data with an agency called Wood for Trees. And we discovered something very, very interesting, which we didn't know at all. Our head of communications and I were going, oh, we're a charity. We just attract baby boomers, 55-year-olds. They're getting old. Young people don't like us. And then we looked at our data and discovered that the proportion of young singles was quite remarkable. And after all, if since 2005, 35, 40, 50 percent of our new supporters were coming digitally, why wouldn't they be younger? And if they were younger, well then how were they living their lives? And that led on to a fairly kind of intense discussion, a rapid one, about this. If we were already getting a considerable proportion of people who were supporting us coming via the web, surely they would now be doing that perhaps on a mobile phone. These are these, you know, Office of National Statistics, you guys know this stuff, this is your field. But if we're talking about young singles and the proportion of them who have internet access and using it on a mobile phone, we need to be able to deal with that, otherwise we're going to go into decline. And I remember seeing this BBC story about, uh, for the first time, PC laptop production was dropping hugely in the first quarter of, I think, 2013. So, we mapped all our data systems, and our, the, syst the database, by the way, the fundraising database is here. And I can't really adequately do justice to this. The key thing for us in then doing everything we did next was to fully understand the relationship between all the different suppliers and data systems we work with, so that when we then did something new, it wouldn't crash everything. But what we didn't do is we didn't rationalize this into one amazing integrated digitally enabled database. We just decided to work with the old technology we had. So uh, we work with Blue State Digital and jointly our um, American, Canadian and UK MSF got together. We have a, a global project in MSF for a new Drupal CMS which was built by an agency called Dot Projects in Belgium. But actually what happened was our head of digital, Ben, really in a way took charge of that project on the design side, working with his Canadian and American counterparts. And they built a website that was responsive design. And this is my very clumsy attempt to demonstrate that. I'm not a technical person. But you, I've got to tell you, I, was, I almost exploded when I heard about responsive design. I was like, this is what we need because we have these young people and they're, they're, on, they're using their phone. We need to get, we need to kind of be, we need to basically kind of adapt to their lives and do that rapidly. That data, that CMS and website is integrated with our media database, which is one global system that we use for the whole of MSF. Um, it's been going for years and through various iterations and improvements. So, you know, there's something quite kind of ambitious here, but not huge amounts of money being spent. The really unglamorous part, I said there were a lot of projects we did. We did 11 projects in 12 months. One of the most important but least glamorous bits was having a, a, a donation system which was separate from our website that would work on mobile, responsive design, and building that and integrating PayPal, which we did. This has all happened in the last 12 months, more or less. We also uh, switched our email system so that it was basically responsive design, we'll work on mobile. Again, that was going back here. That was built so it integrated with our old database, so at least we could do some things that are right. And having that map of those systems was critical in making that work. If we hadn't mapped those systems with external help, we would never have made this work at all. We'd be dead in the water. Uh, yep, email. Digital engagement, getting our supporters to send messages to 
our field volunteers at Christmas and then sending the messages back and describing that in our newsletter. We did that. SMS, we launched SMS Giving. We've been behind a lot of other charities on this. And we launched it, but the most difficult part was again, that when we looked at how SMS Giving was working for other charities, we realized that this stuff, for some charities at least, wasn't working very well. We wanted to get that data onto our database, so we had to build that. That's all happened in the last 12 months. And SMS became the rate determining step for direct response TV. So we went back on air. Our previous campaign had not worked at all. Here's Paul, the surgeon I mentioned earlier, in our campaign for Syria. We asked people to make text donations. Frankly, we were blown away by the results. I mean, we'd been not doing so well for several years, and suddenly thousands of people are sending text donations. Often, for TV spots that we wouldn't have thought would have worked so well, and we converted 15% of them to regular giving at an average gift of eight, eight, eight pounds a month using the telephone. So we went from struggling to recruit new regular donors and grow, the, grow our income to actually being able to scalably grow it from TV. And previously, we would have been able to spend maybe about 20,000 pounds a month on TV and have the results be acceptable. Upper limit, 30,000. This campaign went out, that upper limit went up to 150,000. So not only did the results go up, but our ability to do these things scalably came up. But SMS was the rate determining step for making TV work. And again, it's mobile. So, some results. Now, these results are produced by Lee, who's our digital fundraising manager. Um, and it's his work, not mine. I'm just the fundraiser. I'm the head of fundraising. Um, so, basically, what you see in these results is, unsurprisingly, moving to a responsive design website, we see the, the uh, you know, 68% increase in a comparative period of mobile tablet revenue, 84% increase in the percentage of donations coming through mobile and tablet, um, and a, a whole load of indicators that say that this really, really worked. Now, the numbers aren't huge, but of course, this is growth. And something I learned very early on when we saw digital fundraising starting to take off in 2005 was, if you're starting at a low base, but you have a high growth rate, what looks to today as though it's unimportant will tomorrow become mainstream. So, uh, but this, for me anyway, is the more important part of the story. Because we were doing all of these small things in combination successfully, overall, our income went up by 46% in one year. And previously, it flatlined more or less for four or five years. Um, the money that went to places like Sastan increased by the same amount, and web donations within the current year, new ones, went up by 91%. It's a combination of things that then led to this result. Because that TV campaign that's asking for people to make a text donation, people also see it and give online. You know. Oh, and this, this point. For every pound we spent on fundraising, we raised 11. Because... Probably the most important thing of all in making this all work is this slide. Here are the people who did all of that work in, in our teams. Now, Louise and Pamela and Ben and Shona and Helen and Aisha and Nick and Lee are in the digital team and the fundraising team. And the digital team is part of our communications team. Our entire charity is in one room, roughly the size of this room, and the digital and comms team and the fundraising team are all in one end of the office. We all sit together. So as we joke, we always know what's going on in communications because we can hear them shouting. That's integration. So actually, that in many ways enabled this to work. And also that Ben and his digital team of one, two, three, were given the budget and the autonomy to just get on and do what they needed. Um, and that we all collaborated together and then shared the results. So we went from an attempt to do integration that was really not very good, something of a disaster, to success. And having these people, because when we were doing our planning for last year, all of these people at different points were in the same room, working together in workshops, doing the stuff that you've been doing here, flip charts taking those ambitions, turning them into the plan. I had almost no involvement in the plan whatsoever. These are the people who set our ambitions. These are the people who decided we were going to do 11 projects that year and delivered them. And uh, 
And apart from anything else, they're a lot younger than me, which helps when you're dealing with this stuff. That's it. Thank you.